I doubt myself constantly. I think that's part of being self-aware. The more you doubt yourself, the more that idea that you love, you really love, because it had to pass so many checks and balances. In 2007, a 15-year-old in Connecticut had an idea. Kenny Beats was a music-obsessed teen who already played multiple instruments when he finally picked up an MPC. Through a confluence of inspiration and perspiration, in no time he'd find himself in the studio with major artists, attending one of the most prestigious music schools, and even blowing up as an EDM DJ, all before he would re-emerge back in hip-hop, carving his own lane. His fluidity as a producer has allowed him to work across multiple genres and collaborate with everyone from Doja Cat to Freddie Gibbs. And through his beloved YouTube series, The Cave, and a massive footprint on Discord and Twitch, he's created a uniquely interactive digital community. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your ambitions? I was an only child, and both my parents worked. My dad worked two jobs when I was a kid, and my mom worked like eight to six type of hours. So I had a lot of time by myself. I had a lot of time to figure out you know, what interest me as a kid. Your dad was a fairly accomplished basketball player. Played pro in Europe, yeah, yeah. Did any of that inform how you thought about competition or you know any other parts of life? I've seen my dad shoot a million jump shots. I've seen my dad on so many Saturdays and Sundays when I was a kid after he worked all damn week, like go to the YMCA and I would just sit there with like action figures at four years old and my dad would shoot a thousand free throws. All those hours my dad spent doing the thing he loved, it always gave me this bar for how bad do I want something. I still kind of think about that to this day of just what's the difference between when I work nine to five, five days a week, and when I go 14 hours a day for a month. And that's from 25 to 30 when I really started gunning it and I really started shooting a thousand shots a day, my career went completely different. And my dad was very eclectic. And even though he's this basketball guy, music's what my dad loves. My family would go to a dinner party or somebody's house. My parents wouldn't bring a bottle of wine or like dessert. My, my dad would bring a cassette and he would give people these cassettes that would be like songs from the radio, songs he thinks they would like. And then in between he would talk and he would do this fake radio show. And last year my dad got cancer and I got all of the cassettes and I just started listening to all of them. You hear me as a kid, you hear my dad, you hear me imitating my dad. Hey, uh, this one goes out to all the lonely people out there. Da -da -da -da. I'm five. And so I just got into the sound of it. So I started putting everything on cassette for a moment last year. And like, when you hear like Sundown Town by Vince Staples, and so that's like stuff we put on cassette intentionally to feel nostalgic because it just does something to me. What was the inspiration that made you pick up the guitar when you were nine years old and, and start playing? My godfather, my dad's best friend, took me to Manny's in the city on 48th, bought me a guitar, took me to Michael Jordan's steakhouse in Grand Central, bought me a steak. <laughs> best day of my life, changed my whole life. I started playing guitar that night, never stopped. Didn't matter if my parents were home or what they were doing, what was going on, like I was just always making music all the time. My parents, loved music in a way that I felt like, even me being six, seven and playing basketball or like getting really good grades or whatever, I couldn't get as much of a reaction out of my parents as if I played something really good on guitar. So I feel like that made me want to get good at it. So how are you learning? If you just search the guitar tab, any song, it would come up and it would say, this string, this number on the fret. And I'll go, okay, fifth string, fifth fret. And I would figure out a chord over a half hour. I didn't have a guitar teacher, I didn't have anything. I'm just trying to play songs that my dad liked. And my dad would sit there after work and listen to me suck at guitar so loud. And that's that was how I formed my, my musical mind. That's how I started playing instrument. How did you make the leap from playing guitar, messing around with live drum kits, to getting on a drum machine and starting to, to make beats? As years went by, guitar wasn't impressing my friends. 
And so I started trying to make beats. And I remember playing my one friend, this like shitty beat ride completely stolen from this Pharrell, or sorry, Timbo video. Timbo did this beat for Brandy. And I'd stole the whole beat and remade it in GarageBand. And my friends were the most impressed with me they'd ever been. Did they know that you had ripped off Timbo? No, 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 this is a Brandy. What do you mean? These kids from Connecticut. I'm literally like playing them this beat that I stole verbatim. And everyone's like, you made this? That was enough right there. That made me go, I need to make beats. Beats were the thing that I could relate to my friends with. And to this day, my barometer is, do my friends love it? That makes me still have the most adrenaline, not Twitter engagement. If all my friends think I'm whack and I'm top 10 on Billboard, I'm gonna wake up every day feeling lame. This is my first beat machine. This is the first thing I was making beats on. This is my MPC 1000. I was making beats like this because every time I would see someone making beats, I would see Just Blaze, he had one of these. I would see Dilla, he had one of these. This was my first experience with like picking drum sounds, picking samples. Where was the technology? Cause like in the nineties, there was this huge chasm between the Dr. Dre's and even people like Easy Mo B's and Sir Jenks and like the sounds that they could get out of their MPCs and their machines versus what like, for example, me and my friends could get out of an MPC. Yeah. Were you able to get almost like professional level sounds from the beginning? That's like the thing I'm always trying to explain to people. You had to network just to get drums that were of like semi-professional level. And MySpace was kind of what Reddit and Discord and all these things are now, where I was messaging Hip Boy at 16 years old with my beats and just being like, yo, please listen to these, da, da, da. He had like a Pussycat Dolls placement and was like working with Polo the Don and stuff. And I was literally messaging Hip Boy and chasing Cash nonstop, trying to just get them to hear my beats and Chase and him both would respond and be like, your ideas are cool, your drums are trash. <laughs> and I remember like being like, ah, oh, he's right. <laughs> and I would listen to their drums. And a couple months later, someone sent me a kit. And I heard a snare in that kit that I knew from like some fabulous song. And I was like, oh my God. Now it's the opposite. Now you can get anything. If a song from Uzi comes out yesterday, the snare is on Reddit tomorrow for free. So these kids who are 15 now look at me and they're like, I'm the elder statesman of current production, but the technology like evolving has made it so easy now for kids to jump that learning curve. And someone could take what those five years took me and learn it on YouTube and Reddit and Discord in a month. In 2022, someone who is sitting down to make music for the first time, what I would tell them is put as much stuff as your computer can fit on your computer, which means sounds, samples, any type of idea you can get from anywhere, whether it's Reddit or a site like Splice or whatever, when you sit down and make music, if you have more cool things to pick from, more things that sound really good, it's gonna start you off with confidence. You might, by chance, end up on something you love faster. What did it feel like the first time you heard someone rap on one of your beats? <sighs> His name's Sean Bucks. He lived a couple towns over from me. I recorded him in my dad's closet. He's 15 years old. And then there was this thing called AIM. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, AOL yeah, yeah. Instant Messenger. It's big on AIM. I sent every single person on my buddy list a song. Some people hated on it, some people loved it, but I remember, it wasn't when I first heard him rap on it. I got to school and one of my friends was playing it out of their car. And something I made with a rapper on it was playing out of somebody's car. Like it, even to this day, there's no check I've gotten since then that felt like that felt. What I tell people now with, this, with the stuff that we do for producers, one day of someone getting a bunch of comments, a bunch of love, a confidence boost, that could be all you need for five years. You know what I mean? That could be, that could be enough for that person who's teetering with like, should I keep going with music or should I go get a job or should I leave this safety net of my job and go pursue this thing I love? It's like, if a hundred people all tell you you're amazing, you're gonna do it. What were you listening to at that time? with my friends, G-Unit, and then at home, like Willie Nelson, Sade, any classic rock you can think of. My dad liked The Chronic as much as he liked uh, Whitney Houston. And at what point did you sort of take what you're learning here, listening to these records with your father, and start thinking about applying it to the music that you're listening to with your friends? Probably not till after Berkeley. Really? Like, no, I wasn't even playing guitar on my beats till I was like 24. And I played guitar since I was nine. I made beats since I was 15. I kind of kept 
these worlds separate. And then it got to be me being in studios in 19, 20, whatever, and I'd pick up a guitar and play a guitar, and someone would be like, you play guitar? Everybody started telling me, you should be playing on your beats. You should be incorporating this stuff. And whenever I used to think, how can I make the best beat that sounds like the radio? Never worked. When I started just being myself and like living all these influences in my music, people started saying, that's crazy. That sounds awesome, dude. This is your sound. It took me so long to realize that like, it's all music. I just got to this moment a couple of years ago where I wanted to start from scratch more often. Taking a day to just make drum sounds or play a bunch of guitars through a bunch of different pedals or try stuff in my program. Like the next time I'm with an artist, my vocabulary is just so much wider. So say I get in that position and I'm with someone I'd love to work with, new artist, big artist, and they say, today let's make flamenco. Today let's do something Brazilian. I got a chord change. I got a, a sound I can reach for. I got a drum kit. Prior to going to school, you start to meet people in the real music industry, Johnny Shipes in particular. How are you even making these introductions or, or getting into these circles? There was a producer and he had gone to my high school at one point and he was now producing for Snoop and working with Ryan Leslie and out in LA doing all these big sessions. His name is Alex Sanzo. Alex just took me under his wing and he would drive me to the city every day and we'd go to the studio on 48th where they would give him studio time. I would go to the studio any time I could after work, after school, whenever Alex would pick me up, I'd go with Alex to the studio. And some days I didn't press a single button. I was basically his runner and other days him and I would make beats together. I met Nipsey in that studio. I met Currency in that studio. I met French Montana in that studio. I met Johnny Shipes, who I would intern for in that studio. And this is me at 17, 18 years old. I would go to these managers and these ancillary people who I would see that were always tagged by the artists or always in the pictures with the artists. And I would hit them up and say, do you need any help? Is there anything I can do? I sell weed, I make beats. <laughs> Is there anything that you need? It was always about creating value. And that turned into years later, learning to engineer, which turned into years later, now recording whole bands and doing the things I'm doing now. I just try to make sure that my skill set or what I'm bringing to the table is more than the person next to me, so I'll get the job. I hit Johnny in the DMs and I just said, is there anything I can do? And he gave me an address, I met them there the next day, brought all my beats, all my weed, all my resume points with me. And that night I got a placement for a song called Continental Kush Breakfast with Smoke Dizza. And then Johnny said, yeah, you're my intern now. And I was his first intern. The days where Johnny was too busy for me to come intern, he would send me to this building called DD172 that Dame Dash was running. And I would go on my off days and help out at Dame Dash's spot. What was it like being around Dame as a 18 year old in that moment? Wild. I grew up on Dipset and Rockefeller and I grew up on Jay-Z and all these things and you know who Dame is. Being around somebody like that who was so influential in your childhood even, it just makes you feel like it's painting out. Just hearing Dame Dash yelling next to you about some architecture or like some like big record that's gonna come out or whatever, I'm like, I'm in this room. And all of this was unpaid, I assume? Completely unpaid for many, many years. And even all my first beats went completely unpaid. When you're doing this internship, did you explicitly know that you wanted to be a producer or did you just know sort of broadly, I wanna work in music or in the music industry? I wanted to be a producer and I didn't think people were just gonna give me a shot to play beats, so I was like, if I'm the intern and everybody likes me, or I'm the person who's helping the manager out all the time and I get in cool with everybody and I got the best weed, hmm. sooner or later, I'm gonna play a beat. And that's what happened. And I played that first beat and got a placement. And then that person introduced me to Yams, who introduced me to Rocky, who introduced me to Arab music, who introduced me to, and it just, that's how it went when I was younger. In my career, I attribute a ton of things to luck because I don't really understand how else they could have happened. I'm a white kid from Connecticut who makes rap music. There's so many things that I wasn't supposed to get a shot to do that people gave me an opportunity to do. I just try to work my hardest at everything that's put in front of me to do the best I can. Just as his momentum was starting to pick up, Kenny's path had to take a turn. Following a commitment to his parents to pursue higher education, he left behind the connections he had forged in New York and headed to the Berklee College of Music in Boston. 
a world-class institution for music, the school equipped Kenny with vital information for his craft, but it also isolated him from opportunity, or at least that's what he thought at first. Before long, he'd find a way to flip the situation in his favor. You have this natural momentum, you're starting to make moves, you haven't quite got to the place where you're like really making music per se, but you're making the connections, you can feel that things are, are breaking in the way that you want them to. Yeah, yeah. After high school, you decide that you want to go to Berkeley School of Music. Were your parents supportive of this? To be real, yeah, I wouldn't have gone to school if it was up to me. My one thing with my mom was you are going to go to college and you are going to graduate college. And that was a thing since I was five. I remember I had this session and Yams came and Yams asked me for some beats. He called me like a couple days later and was like, oh, we're using these, da, da 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 And I was like going to orientation the day after. And I remember leaving and being like, Rocky is about to get on my beats, the, my favorite rapper, the hottest artist in New York City, maybe the world in this moment. And I'm about to go do orientation with these assholes. Like I was so mad because I really was in the thick of it. But I had this weird little island in Boston where, yeah, I'm going to school, I'm sick of it, I'm taking tests, this and that, but whenever TDE came to Boston or whenever ASAP came to Boston or whenever Danny Brown came to Boston, I go bring him some weed, go hang out, whatever. That's how I got to beat the schoolboy Q. You know what I mean? That's how I worked with Danny for the first time. That's how me and Absol worked for the first time. That's how Mac Miller ended up on something like that. That's how I met Mac. I'd get to have a solo one-on-one -on -one interaction with an artist who I could never get like that kind of time with in New York City. I'd be in a studio with 10 people, at a show with 20 people backstage. Like maybe you dap someone up, maybe they remember your name. Now these people knew me. The first 25 years of my life was just like, how do I get a beat to an artist? You know what I mean? How do I make a song? Now it's so far beyond that. I put out thousands of songs produced by me. Looking back on the output and everything, I feel so strong about the last few years, but I feel even stronger about betting on myself the next few years. Was there anything that you took from your collegiate experience from the classes that has had lasting value? There was a teacher there named George Howard who had sold a label in his 20s for millions of dollars. I listened so hard in that class because I knew my teacher was the f man. I was like, this guy, he helped start TuneCore. He was like a manager of a big artist at the time. Teaching was something he was clearly doing for the love. Learning from somebody who could actually show me what they've done on paper, it meant more to me for some reason. And I try to be that way now with people, and that's why I talk about so much of the shitty parts of my career. I've gone through the bad contracts being offered to me, and I've gone through people f***ing me over and stealing my music and taking credit and being treated awful, and I'm here now. That means if you're facing something, it's like you can get past it, and I'm telling you that from experience. To that point, you've talked in the past about how when you got those first placements, the smoke dizzas and things like that, you weren't really being very buttoned up about the, the business side of that at all. Is that what motivated you to major in business at Berkeley? It was honestly the same time. I was getting, not by Dizza, but for other beats I was doing and stuff, I was getting f***ed over while I was in business class. And I'd be in business, I swear this is so a real thing. So you're, you know that you're getting f***ed over and you're still- I'm learning it as we're going. I would read something in class and I'd be like, perpetuity? And I go look, oh my God. I remember there was one day I left Jeff Dornfield's class. Man, it was a management class. I went home and looked at my contract for a beat that I just like signed in the media center at Berkeley and faxed back to like whatever I standard or some company. And I had given away all the rights to the beat for the rest of my life and all of the publishing and everything. And like slowly having to just like ask more questions every time someone wanted a beat from me. Oh, can I, uh, get publishing on this one, <laughs> like, it was really all happening at once. So at what point did you get a manager and get a lawyer and? It wasn't until uh, I left making rap beats and started doing a completely different style of music with a whole different yep. thing in mind. I was a senior at Berkeley and my friend had dropped out and moved to LA, started sending me clips of DJs, DJs like Bauer and like RL Grime and stuff. And they were just making instrumental music with trap drums and putting it on SoundCloud. My boy's like, yo, they're killing these shows. I just went to the show last night, 5,000 people watching Bauer, blah, blah, blah. I just made this beat for Schoolboy Q. Everybody was telling me it sounded like EDM. It sounded like the sounds I was using weren't rap sounds. 
So I started making beats with my friend and we put them on SoundCloud. Within a week, getting hit up by agents, managers, they all wanted this new sound. All the stuff that I wish had happened to me when I was younger happened when I started making this thing I wasn't sure about. I started making this genre because people were like, yo, you should really do this. And I was leaving Berkeley, didn't have a label job set up. The money I was making on weed or beats or anything was not enough to go pay rent. This seemed like the most viable way to take my talent and do something with it. Looking to capitalize on EDM's surge in popularity, Kenny teamed up with fellow DJ Ryan Marks and the duo formed Loud Pack. On the back of Kenny's musical virtuosity and Ryan's deep connections to the scene, the group found near immediate success, booking prominent remixes and hundreds of live shows. What was the nature of sort of the creative partnership between you and Ryan? He was the informational side of it. He taught me about electronic music, what the sounds were, how people produce those songs. You need a build up here, you need an intro here. The intro has to be just drums so you can mix songs into it. And I was just kind of like a production nut and it would make anything. I have a million sounds, I could do whatever. So you point me in any direction, I would just go. How did you feel about actually being the performer? It taught me so much about the music I'm making in real life. You're not playing just your songs at these shows. I'll play a Travis song into a Daft Punk song into maybe a thing I made into something else. You're just trying to make people emote. When you go back in the studio and you realize what worked, what didn't, what was the lowest point in the crowd, what wasn't, it teaches you so much about pop. It teaches you about uh, songwriting. It teaches you about arrangement. I started looking at music with a bird's eye view. How is, are people going to hear this when it leaves this room? How is this going to fit in these 10 songs? I think live shows and sets gave me that. But then years into it, I started feeling this disconnect of, I never grew up listening to Skrillex. I'm not someone who, you know what I mean, has Daft Punk posters on my wall. This isn't what I feel in my heart the way I do when I work on rap stuff or work on pop stuff or anything else. So that's the embarrassment in talking about it now. It's like, I feel like I was faking the funk for a couple years. I was kind of just doing the thing that worked instead of fighting the good fight to do the thing that like I feel in my heart, I feel in my stomach. The biggest professional L I've taken is spending years doing something I wasn't wholeheartedly invested in. Looking back on it, I wish that there were certain moments where I only focused on what I love, what my friends love, what makes me want to cry, what makes me want to scream instead of the check. Years before Laupac stopped, and the public doesn't know this, but years before I stopped DJing, I was trying to start doing the Kenny thing. And I wasn't actively doing a lot of sessions or sending beat packs out, but I was saying to my team and to the people around me, my friends, I think I want to get back to making beats. I think I want to get back to like working with artists instead of being an artist. The way people I was working with at the time reacted to it, I just knew it wasn't it. In that four year period, you guys reached a certain level of acclaim. You got the drums on the Bieber record, you got the Chainsmokers remix that was huge, and you built a brand in Loud Pack. Was it hard in any way for you to walk away from having put all of that blood, sweat, and tears into building something that had that resonance? Not for a second. I've never listened to one of those songs since the day I shut the, like, the social media down. Not once. I looked back on four or five years of making music and I'm like, I don't like this music, but this is who I am now. This is how people know me. Yeah. It's not Kenny Beats, the young kid who did that Kendrick beat, it's you are DJ. You know what I mean? For me to not only flip the music I'm making, go out on my own for the first time really, try to do rap production, you know what I mean? After this many years later, it felt like insurmountable. And it was like the hardest moment. I was in huge debt from commissions I owed. My father was in a coma, he had overdosed. And when I was at my lowest, lowest of lows of my entire life, my best friend started managing me. He looked me in my face and said, you're gonna be one of the biggest producers. You're gonna be a great, legendary producer. I know it. Kenny was down, but not out. He knew the type of music that he didn't wanna be making, but now he had to figure out how to break back into the music that he did wanna make. So he immersed himself in the culture, tapped into his network, and just started working. It wasn't overnight, but eventually, he would not only become one of the most sought after producers in hip hop, but an innovator within music's digital ecosystem. So you come to this point of inflection that you describe as a low point, and you decide to pivot 
and go back to making hip hop beats and being a hip hop producer. What is step one, day one, to start building towards that? You know nothing. That's what I would tell myself. My production technical ability was better than it had ever been in my life. And I started trying to make rap beats again and they just felt stale. I knew they weren't right. I knew the drums didn't hit right. I knew the energy wasn't there. And step one was just learning. I invited anybody and everybody to this horrible little studio I was renting in like some weird area in Burbank. That was the cave. That became the cave. And I just tried to re-educate myself. And a lot of the time it's me who's co-produced with Skrillex and done all this big boy stuff, learning from a 17 year old who doesn't know how to do like the most basic thing in production, but they are the sound right now. They know something I don't know. I had to see it in front of me from the people who are really doing it. And to enter back into the scene, I didn't want to feel like I was playing people fake versions of something that they really wanted. I wanted to make the closest to the real thing. And I had to start from square one. I love to learn almost to a fault. I'm obsessed with just being the student. I'm obsessed with being the dumbest person in the room. I'm watching a YouTube tutorial when I'm going to take a piss. And then when I lie down at night, I've got to read three things about some gear. Trust me, it's hurt relationships in my life. It's done a lot of things that aren't positive, but I want to cover my blind spots. When one looks at your discography, it's kind of like a exponential growth that happens from like 2016 to 2018, where you go from having a handful of placements to having like 75 placements in 2018. How did you engineer that? That model I was just speaking about never stopped for years. Anybody who wanted to come make music would come make music. And I was at that studio 16 hours a day. As artists started to want to work with me, and they knew they could come work for free. I'll make any beat you want to make. There's always something to drink, some food, some weed there. And it's 24 seven anytime you want, as long as there's no one else there. It became a place where he got really comfortable. Rico got really comfortable. Freddie Gibbs got really comfortable. Vince started coming by all the time. You know what I mean? Like things that didn't feel like the biggest things back then. But now when I tell the story, now when I say it was Thundercat left right before Young Dolph got there, right before Doja Cat was leaving or something. It just kept going and got to the point where I'm doing 20 songs in a week. How are you financing all of this? How are you staying afloat? At first, there was a moment where I had less than $1,000 to my name and I have a studio that costs about that much in rent. I have an apartment, I have a car, I got I help my family, I got phone bills, whatever. Don't have enough money to even pay this one month worth of stuff. And I would go to my business manager who think of it, I have a business manager. I have someone I'm paying 5% of everything to manage my business and I have a thousand bucks. But those people put me in a situation to where I could build from there and where I could get out of that hole and where I could, they believed in me so much and what I was gonna do that you gotta understand me not taking uh, money for these beats or these studio sessions. Think about my lawyer, think about my business manager, think about my manager. They're doing contracts for 50, 60, 100 songs that are making no money. You know how hard that is to convince a lawyer who's making millions of dollars a year to do my contracts that aren't gonna make you shit. Through that whole period, getting back on my feet wasn't as much the concern financially as it was career-wise. I just needed to keep making songs and I just knew that. And then there were these moments where you don't get paid on beats, you don't get paid on beats, you don't get paid on beats, you do a whole album. You get paid for 10 beats, you know what I mean? And even if you're only making 5K a beat, $50,000 for me in that year is life-changing money. $50,000 for most people watching this is life-changing money. How did you decide that you wanted to start moving in that collaborative full album zone? And were you having those conversations with the artist at the front door or was it kind of like, well, we just made 15 amazing songs, so... It was never at the front door and it's never something that I think of or bring up to this day. The first time it happened, I had made so many songs with someone that they said, all right, this is a you and me project. I'm gonna wear the Kenny from South Park hoodie on the cover and da da da. And I was just like, wait, what the fuck? First of all, don't wear that hoodie. But second of all, my name is going on the project. I remember calling Mike and being like, yo, yo, they said it's my project too. And my name is gonna be on. I'd never even fathomed that. Now looking back on it, so many producers who have 10 times more Drake, Kanye, whatever giant placements than me, they come to me and they say, how do you do those full projects? 
How do you end up getting your name tagged on Spotify as an artist with the, with the artist? Like, it doesn't make sense to people. Rico did it. Freddie and Lambo, when they put out that project, they put my name in every press blast. When I did FM for Vince, Vince had headlines and Rolling Stone and everywhere. Vince Staples and Liss, Kenny Beats, da, da, da. sometimes people have taken care of that for me and just put my name along with all the other important info they send out. And I think the reason is because people have found a home in these places we're working and these albums we're working on. They, they're seeing me every day for months talking about everything in their life, everything in my life, and we're making all these songs. When the project finishes, I think people have put it in my head almost that this is your project too, because I still will never say that. And if you've made people feel like you're really helping them out or feel really excited about what they're doing, they're gonna try to do it for you. And a lot of artists have done it for me. They've showcased my charisma through their platforms and that's led me to having a fan base. How do you think about creating that environment and setting that table for artists? I wanna set people up to where when they say something on the mic, they love how they sound. Whenever they walk into the room, they just love everything they're looking at in every corner, whether it's my action figures and cool little synths and custom painted stuff and whatever it is, or if it's just having their best friends around. I try to figure that out as fast as possible, along with the engineering side. Everybody hates how they sound. When I listen back to this interview, I'm gonna go, oh, that's my voice. When anybody hears themselves on a voicemail, they go, that's what I sound like? Artists feel the same way. Adele feels like that. You have to understand that setting up someone to feel cool or sexy or talented or smart or whatever can unlock something in creative geniuses that is unparalleled. You know what I mean? It's like if you can make someone feel like they're really good at what they're doing, they're gonna do things you never even knew they could do. Do you have a tried and true process to creating songs or do you have to adapt to each artist? It's completely different every time. The only thing that I would say is my process every time with every artist is just questions. What do you love right now? What are you listening to? What's your favorite thing you've made recently? What's up with you outside of music? Those four questions can get you really far. As a producer, you sort of have to balance on the one hand, being an artist yourself. On the other hand, coaching a highly sensitive person. How do you navigate that? I'm a highly sensitive person too. I think I understand it. I work with so many people whose minds are not normal and that's why their art is not normal and their songs are so good. It's because they're not like everybody else. And I used to worry that me having so much charisma or me and Zach Fox making a joke or doing uh, a YouTube show or The Cave would keep someone like Twigs or someone who is this unique artist who doesn't work with everybody from wanting to work with me. And I realized it was kind of the opposite. I just navigate all that kind of stuff by not thinking of it as networking or not thinking of it as how do we get to the song? How do I just have a conversation with this person and get along? And if you can get along with somebody, you can make a record with them. most important part of my creative routine. Conversation. I'll go into a week thinking, this is how I'm looking at music. This is what I want to make. This is the point of what I'm making. This is who I want to work with. And one conversation with someone else will completely shift how I go into the studio that day. One conversation with one of my friends where I play them a song and they say a good or bad thing about it. One artist playing me their favorite new thing completely shifts what sound I'm going to reach for, what instrument I'm going to pick up, what chords I'm going to play. That's what gets me going and excited and inspired and through the creative blocks is somebody who I think is great saying something to me that I haven't thought of. 2018, you get a ton of placements. In 2019, you really seem to consciously pivot your brand to the forefront of how you were presenting. And you start the cave and the Twitch and the Discord. Was there a light bulb moment that you made that conscious switch? My friends are really smart. Um, my, like I said, my best friend's my manager and Don't Overthink shit is a company of my five best friends. We do clothing, we do designs, we do shows, we do live events, we run digital communities like the second biggest Discord in music. These people create that value around me where I'm a music guy. If I told you that something like The Cave or 
treatments for music videos or artwork for albums were things that crossed my mind all the time, I'd be lying to you. Having a team of people around me allowed me to be so much more than what they allow producers to be. When my cool homies became my business partners, Kenny Beats went like this. I'm 30 right now. The last five years of my life have been the best five years of my life. I've done things I could never accomplish. And that's not just with beats and with music, it's with helping my friends, helping my family, starting a company, you know what I mean? With my homies and doing great things for people who make music. This is all right, like uncharted territory. Tell me the story of how Discord gets presented to you and how do they sell you on it? I think the first time it even comes into frame for me is random DMs from supporters or fans just being like, yo, Kenny, come into this Discord. And that's the first time I saw the name. And there's a lot of things you'll see when you go on that app that are just categories. There's a musician's Discord. It's crazy to say the Kenny Beats Discord is bigger than the musician's Discord at this point. But when we got on there, people were just like, yo, come on this website. Then Mike came to me and Mike goes, all right, well, you know, everybody, if you have a Twitch, you start the Discord with the Twitch. And basically the idea is all the people who are watching your stream all the time and are really interested in that community or the cave, this would be like a place for them to go 24 seven and maybe they could start their own little shows or little things together, or collaborate or whatever. It just, that was how it was presented. I have 123,000 people in there as we're talking. That's crazy. I have that many producers I can ask a question to right now. This hive mind now is a true kind of power and it's a different kind of platform than my other social media. Kids have gotten signed to major labels without paying me a single dollar, all because everyone in the Discord said they're hot. This was one kid, 16 years old, DVR. He made four demos on a version of Ableton, the free version. You didn't pay for it. You can't even save your work. He made four songs, he put them in the Discord. Hundreds of kids said, this kid's the one, this kid's the one. I'm getting calls from Polydor, from XL Records, from Atlantic. Kids signed to XL Records. He's on the same label as Adele and Radiohead and all this stuff. And he came out of the Discord and made some free songs. When people see that, that's power. How has the implementation of these sort of more community or media products transformed the business of Kenny Beats? The business of Kenny Beats changed whenever we had a digital community with YouTube or Discord where we're showing 700,000 people followed my YouTube the first year I started it, you know? Like our Discord became the second biggest Discord in the music category the year we started it. I've now become a person where if you're having a label meeting about technology for young musicians, I'm in the convo. If you wanna talk about it in just regular layman's terms, the bags that come across our desk now are to consult for a major company or to come in and help someone review products to see if people in the music making landscape are gonna really react to this because they know that hive mind sitting in a Discord with my name on it. So when you look at 2022, 2023, what are the goals that you have? Help as many people as far away as possible get excited and inspired. I wanna make sure that along with continuing my personal path of making more music, making better songs, making great art, I help more people make more art. And I used to think my goal was just making the best songs, you know, and these last couple of years, like all these things we're talking about have started to spiral into something where you think, what can you really do for music? Is it just add another song to the board? Because I love music. It's all I ever want to do, but it's as much my hobby as my job. I'm going to do it even when I'm not working. I'm never going to be businessman, Tony Robbins, Gary V. Kenny, you know what I mean? And then talk about when I used to make records. I'll make records till I die, but I want to give that feeling to as many people as possible.